Hare Krishna Maharaj ji. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really an honor for us uh, that you kindly agreed uh, to be part of our uh, this uh, discussion. So it's more of like uh, we want to learn from your experiences. Uh, last many decades, uh, you have been practicing uh, Krishna Bhakti and uh, you are into academia. So we want to learn from you. Um, so it's really a great privilege and honor for us that you kindly agreed. So uh, I think uh, there are some people already joined. So you can start. Other uh, others should join subsequently. Mm -hmm. so, it's my so, pleasure I, to be with you. Yeah, thank you. So before I formally start, uh, let me introduce uh, today's guest. So Dr. Kenneth Valpe, uh, uh, also known as uh, Krishna Chatra Maharaj, Krishna Goswami, is a teacher, writer, and a traveler. He is a research fellow at uh, OCH. It's, it's Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, uh, where he's the co-director of uh, the project on Bhagavad Puran, the research project on that. Together with uh, Professor Ravi Gupta, he has edited a volume of articles and translated a volume of uh, selection from Bhagavad Puran. Both volumes uh, are actually published by Columbia University. And myself uh, have uh, gone through many of the chapters uh, and I found them really fascinating and very enlightening. And... Uh, Dr. Valpe, uh, I'm sorry if I pronounce your <laughs> name properly. <laughs> yes, that's quite right. Yeah, okay, thank you. Dr. Valpe is also a research fellow at the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics. Uh, recently, he published uh, a book on animal ethics, which is also one of the topic of discussion uh, in this series. Uh, and he's an associate uh, at Oxford Center for Animal Ethics, OCAE where he has written and lectured on nonviolence, environmentalism, as well as on the application of yoga principles uh, and practices for animal-human relationships and animal protections. And uh, most notably uh, for me, uh, uh, Krishna Maharaj's uh, articles, his lectures particularly, and of course uh, books, uh, it's really enlightening. I find uh, after reading them, after hearing his lectures, I find quite nourished. Uh, so I felt uh, all our audience also would benefit from his association. So today's topic uh, that I plan is a uh, discussion on uh, God, the absolute nature of God and uh, Maya or the evil in a, a moral, ethical sense. Uh, so we want to discuss that. Uh, so, and we want to hear uh, from uh, Krishna Hathar Swami, uh, his uh, from his, what, um, I mean, different uh, aspects of uh, nature of God at, as it is described in Gaudiya Vaishnava understanding or particularly from the Bhagavatam point of view. And also uh, in a generic academia since uh, we want to learn from him. So before we begin, so uh, I plan, Maharaj, uh, uh, maybe uh, usually what we do, we ask questions uh, to our guest in response mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that is the pattern we follow. So maybe mm -hmm. uh, if you have anything, uh, any particular way to guide us, that's uh, also acceptable for us. Otherwise, you can continue like that. Let's play it by ear, as we say in America. We'll see what what comes okay. up. Okay. <laughs> so, so before we start, uh, could you kindly, uh, could you please tell us uh, the nature of God, I mean, how do you really, uh, like every religion, uh, the ultimate objective is God. So how do uh, Eastern religions, particularly Hinduism, or particularly the Gaudiya Vaishnava understanding, uh, how it differentiates uh, the understanding of God from, uh, I mean, other uh, religions? I mean, do you have any particular way to uh, mm. say so? These are, these are big questions. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, well, you're asking about differentiation, and that's all right, but um, we might also want to explore similarity. Yeah, sure, sure, of course, it included in that. <laughs> uh, uh, if, if we're only looking for difference, then I don't know that may lead us in a certain direction that may or may not be so desirable. Yeah, right. um, 
I personally am more inclined to see similarities, um, but um, if one is only looking for similarity, one uh, also runs the danger of overlooking. The... <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> somebody dropped something. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it, it's it's a challenge to find find the right the middle way, so to say. And you also said all all religions have this characteristic, namely uh, seeking God, but it raises the question of what constitutes a religion. Um, mm -hmm. And the common the common uh, case that's discussed um, whether or not it's a religion is Buddhism, mm -hmm. in which um, it can be argued that the the aim is not to seek God. Uh, depending on which sort of Buddhism you want to consider, because there are many different sorts of Buddhism, including what's called Pure Land Buddhism, which seems to have a lot of, uh, let's say, family resemblance to, to our personalist understanding of, of God. Um, <clears throat> but in general, uh, it's we can say that uh, Buddhist traditions are having a different approach uh, to the problems of life in which they don't consider it necessary to bring in uh, the notion of God. Uh, whether they are atheist or simply non-atheist, uh, sorry, atheist or non-theist, is another question. Um, an atheist would be one who kind of actively declares there is no God, which is a kind of funny thing to say because uh, if there is no God, why is there even need to make that expression? <laughs> why deny what doesn't exist? Uh, why are you even thinking about God if you have to say, God does not exist. Uh, but uh, then there's non-theism, which uh, we also find in Vedic, some streams of uh, Vedic or post-Vedic thought, uh, where the concern is um, God may or may not exist, but it's not our concern. Or we may or may not be able to know uh, if God exists or if he exists, um, who, who that person, what can we know about God? We cannot know, therefore we won't concern ourselves. That's another possibility. Mm -hmm. mm, to make generalizations is also fraught with um, with difficulties, if we look at any given religious tradition of the world, uh, there are traditions and there are sub sub traditions, and these are uh, changing over time as well. So, if we look at um, Western thought about the nature of God, very broadly speaking, uh, meaning from within uh, the Jewish tradition, uh, the Christian tradition, and the Islamic tradition, the so-called Semitic, <coughs> excuse me, religions, or Abrahamic sometimes they're called, uh, there are centuries of discussion about the nature of God. Centuries of writings and reflections uh, by so many, so many of their sages. And so you'll find m many of them may have wonderful insights about the nature of God. So uh, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a challenge. You don't want to 
say something that's oversimplifying. I just came across, let's see if I can find this. Um, <clears throat> I came across an interesting statement uh, by one Islamic theologian from the Middle Ages, uh, which uh, surprised me. He said, here it is. Uh, this is from Al-Kindi, or Yaqub ibn Ishaq Al-Kindi from the ninth <laughs> century. Uh, so he said, we should not be ashamed to acknowledge truth and to assimilate it from whatever source it comes to us, even if it is brought to us by former generations and foreign peoples. For him who seeks the truth, there is nothing of higher value than truth itself. Quite broad it, it, it never cheapens or debases him who reaches for it, but ennobles and honors him. Yeah. Really so nice. that was uh, one of the, uh, one of, they're called the falasuf, uh, the um, philosopher theologians of, uh, of the Islamic, mid medieval Islamic tradition. They were trying to understand God in rational terms, in philosophical terms. Um, <clears throat> anyway, that's just one example, I think, of an openness. I mention that because nowadays, unfortunately, our, um, our world situation is such that we tend to see everything in oversimplified ways, and we label uh, persons in um, stereotyping ways, you know, there's the Hindus and there's the Muslims and and the Christians yeah. and so on. Yeah. And uh, and the effect is that it really depersonalizes all of us. Yeah. And just back to uh, Al Kindi, this uh, quote from him. This reminded me of what we find in Second Canto Bhagavatam, uh, in the Chatur Shloki uh, Bhagavatam, of uh, in chapter nine, spoken by Lord Narayan. Uh, what is it? Etava Deva Krishna. Etava Deva. Um, I never uh, yeah. remember when I have to. Uh, mm, that one should seek. Uh, the truth in all circumstances and at all times. And this is the last of the four verses of the Chatur Shloki. Um, one should seek in all circumstances, in all times, in all places, the truth. And so um, I think that spirit of seeking is Yes. is what we're looking for not not so much the claiming that we have it all we've got the whole thing and um, therefore there's no more seeking necessary yes right uh so let's see uh you were asking for differences maybe um you can sketch uh, in a very maybe a little philosophical way. So uh, as I was reflecting uh, through whatever reading that I have uh, in this context, uh, so uh, there seems to be two ways of uh, problem before each of the not only different religions, even within religion, say Hinduism, different mm -hmm. groups also. Uh, two fundamental questions so like uh, say God is a person, a person or it's not a person. And second is uh, probably how does he really uh, relate to its creation? So mm -hmm. probably all of the philosophies that I surveyed, not even, uh, not necessarily religion, say any other philosophy, say pantheism, panentheism, deism, whatever name, 
so everywhere uh, these two fundamental problems uh, seems to uh, be the core uh, ideas so maybe if you can uh, guide us uh, in that uh, direction if you wish um well you you've already said it it's a problem philosophically it's a problem in some ways it's it's something like the mind body problem dualism uh, you know yeah. uh, that what is the relation how how is mind or spirit connected to the body how is it that when i think i want to raise my hand uh, then i can just raise it without it's not a problem i just <laughs> i can do it yeah how how does that work mm -hmm. uh, if if in fact if in fact they are two completely different um principles or substances how is how do they connect right. so in a way it's a similar problem how does what is the connection between between god and the world right. uh, i think i think uh we invariably reach toward analogies in order to to get some idea of how the relation works and speaking of what i just the example i gave how do we connect mind and body um of course the shri vaishnavas ramanuja acharya um, gave exactly this analogy for the relation of god to the world he said uh, that the world is the body of god uh, the relationship is one of body and soul just as we understand for individual persons so it is for god and world and you could then say well that doesn't really solve the problem mm. since we have the problem of what's the relation of this so is, uh, we're just sticking to pantheism kind of understanding that god, every creation is the god only nothing else left <laughs> well that's another that's another kind of solution but um it's been argued that Vaishnavas are panentheists if we're going to speak of yes. pantheism and theism how how are they related um it it's often said we're one would identify as a kind of panentheism which is that god pervades everything um as he explains in so many ways in bhagavad gita and simultaneously as he says in the gita uh, i am separate from i am aloof from everything uh, so uh, that would be the end part of panentheism that god is aloof so all the different traditions have wrestled with this in different ways uh, how to how to close the gap so to say and i think we can generally say of the abrahamic traditions mm -hmm. there's a very strong emphasis on the otherness of god god is is utterly other than the world he is utterly other than us and when we speak of god as having certain attributes we are only speaking analogically we're only speaking as an analogy so when we say god is good what do we mean um uh, well we have from our experience some ideas of goodness right and then we extrapolate from that so therefore god must be perfectly good we mm -hmm. kind of uh, make that uh, an analogical leap something like analytical regression <laughs> if you like yeah so mm -hmm. so the uh the three sort of main um abrahamic traditions of judaism christianity islam have each dealt with this in different ways um and each of them i would say each of them find 
despite the intellectual efforts or other types of efforts uh, to sort of bridge the gap, uh, they they seem to they all have their mystical traditions, yes. whereby uh, they understand if you want to really understand God, you need to um, experience God. And how do you experience God? You do it through um, some sort of mystical pursuit. I was just reading again in this same book um, later about maybe two centuries later, uh, another uh, Muslim uh, scholar, uh, Al-Ghazali, became extremely influential and he started out as one of these uh, falasuf, as they're called. Um, and, um, but he was completely frustrated, frustrated with it. Uh, he, he had practically a mental breakdown. Uh, he was teaching and then suddenly he, he was like he couldn't even speak anymore because he was in such uh, anxiety over the subject of how do we understand really who is God? How can we know for sure um, what we, you know, we have our theories about God, but is he really like that? How do we know? And so then uh, in this kind of state of desperation, uh, he joined the Sufis. <laughs> <laughs> and the Sufis are the mystics of the Islamic tradition, and he was he stayed with with this group of Sufis for ten years, and during that time, um, everything became clear to him that yes, it's about experience, it's about uh, realization, and whatever practices they have, I think they also do some chanting of names of God mm -hmm. and so on. Um, but uh, he, he came, kind of came out of this very powerfully uh, speaking about this necessity to, to realize God, not just to talk about and think about, but to realize by practice. And I think that is, uh, we can say also distinctive about um, our Vaishnava tradition not uniquely uh, the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition and not even uniquely Vaishnavas, uh, mm -hmm. but other uh, theistic traditions in India, that there has to be some practice uh, by which God is realized. And that's where our Srila Prabhupada insisted repeatedly uh, for the word bhakti, he would translate it not as devotion, which is typical um, but as devotional service, right. that you want to realize God, then you have to engage in his service, and that is bhakti, bhakti yoga, of course. Right. So anyway, um, but bridging the gap theologically, uh, coming back now to the Vaishnava tradition, we can also and tying into this idea of service uh, is the whole notion of the Pancharatra system. That um, there is mm, the supreme being is para, and then he expands as vyuha, mm -hmm. and then he expands as vibhava. Mm -hmm. Not terms we use so much in the Gaudiya tradition, but these are standard Pancharatrika terms, uh, and then he expands again as Antaryami, uh, we would say Paramatma, mm -hmm. the Lord in the heart, and finally he expands as Archa Murti, as the Lord in the temple. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to a prominent Sri Vaishnava, um, uh, Pilai Loka Acharya, I think it was, he mm -hmm. said uh, that the all of the forms it's it's like russian dolls one within the other so within the within the archamurti all the other forms are present mm -hmm. 
which means the art archamurti is uh is the most powerful <laughs> yeah. so, anyway so this uh this is the pancharatrika way of you know closing the gap um the the whole notion of avatara in the christian tradition they speak of incarnation and they don't like it when we use the word incarnation uh, because for you know we use it in relation to avatar yeah. uh, christians generally don't like that because their understanding is there is one and one only incarnation uh, so their idea is that jesus um, the son of of the father god has uh, descended has been sent uh, as the christ and he is the one uh, unique link uh, between humanity and god um, yeah that's of course a departure uh, yeah. certainly a radical departure but it it goes with uh, their theology of the trinity um, there is the father the son and the holy spirit we might want to translate holy spirit as paramatma um, <laughs> but i don't know if they would like that <laughs> they won't like <laughs> yeah. Our Paramatma is everywhere and everybody is hard. <laughs> I don't think they would think uh, that way. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm sure there's some, I think there's some parallel there still. I think mm -hmm. there's some, mm -hmm. some space for discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, as uh, from your words, uh, I gather. So uh, two things uh, we're discussing, uh, two approaches to decipher this mystery, whether God is a person or not, or the relation, and the second is the, the connection with the work, his creation. And uh, I mean, the first thing that we define perhaps God, uh, as, as far as I know from our tradition, uh, Vaishnava tradition, so there uh, we talk about God as uh, the source of all possibilities, right, from the Vedanta Sutra, uh, the second verse, second aphorism. Mm -hmm. so, uh, mm -hmm. so in that sense, uh, it becomes inevitable for us to include even the matter, although apparently we make a distinction, we make a divide between uh, God and his creation, say this universe. Uh, but at the same time, we want to embrace also matter within the realm of God because uh, uh, we want God to be the source of all things. So that way, it kind of posits a big uh, intellectual crisis, I would say, <laughs> to reconcile two different opposites. I mean, uh, but uh, how do you see uh, this, these aspects in other uh, traditions and other religions? Um, well, I'm not quite sure I grasp uh, what you're saying, but I wanted to look at uh, this idea of personhood. Okay. Um, and maybe that will help us get to uh, what you want to say, because I have some notes here from one, again, uh, Christian theologian, a modern present day theologian uh, has written, written on uh, something on the idea of divine personhood. And she gives uh, five characteristics of personhood which should be, should be present. Okay. So the first is um, a person has a rational nature, uh, which means it has a capacity for reason and for choice. And this makes, uh, this makes of God, uh, she points out something more than Aristotle's unmoved mover. Um, the, the early Greek philosopher Aristotle had this idea, he kind of reasoned his way to an unmoved mover. Um, mm -hmm. Everything has a cause, mm, and so there must be some uh, cause to all causes. Yeah. Um, and so 
but his his cause of all causes is an unmoved mover and that's all <laughs> it, there's there's no reasoning capacity and no choice he's just kind of yeah not a very full sense of personhood so this is the first a person that has a rational mm -hmm. nature uh, which enables the person to make choices okay. and to reason uh, a second attribute of person a person possesses what is called subjectivity and one way to understand subjectivity is it's self-awareness it's a sense of i am aware that i am speaking right now i am aware that i am um, being seen by others um, and i'm i'm a, i'm aware of myself thinking uh, and it's also subjectivity is also more broadly it's just uh, sentience uh, Srila Prabhupada many times emphasized this point that God is uh, the supreme being and he's the supreme sentient being uh, possessing senses uh, and so God is from this perspective uh, the one who is fully conscious of himself yes and we can't really say that about ourselves. Um, we can't really say much about how our bodies work, for example. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm always um, I'm always amazed by the function of digestion. <laughs> we we just put something in the mouth. We swallow. And that's it. And everything else is done for us, you know. Vice, vice Agni. Yeah. So, so that's the second mm, quality of persons. A third one is that a person has relationships with other persons. And here, I think, is where uh, the Vaishnava tradition, and most especially the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition, really shines. Right. Uh, specifically with uh, the notion of rasa and how God relates to his, uh, well, to all beings, but especially to his et eternal associates in so many wonderful ways right uh, the verse finally came to my mind etavade eva jigyasa tattva jigyasa natmana anvaya vyatareka yam yatsyat sarvatra sarvada that was the point <laughs> going jumping back yatsyat sarvatra sarvada everywhere and at all times mm -hmm both directly and indirectly one should have this desire for for jnana <clears throat> um, to that extent uh, referring to the previous verses anyway uh, yeah, thank you. I'm getting incoherent so relationships Mm -hmm. We might say this is central. We understand what is a person. A person is one who has relations with other persons. Now, at this point, if one could say, well, that sounds um, somewhat circular. Yeah, right. Uh, what, is that, what is that other person that you're having a relationship? And what does it mean to have a relationship? What is that? Well, I think that's what is uh, is filled out by our um, uh, by the Gaudiya tradition, especially as it's been elaborated by our Goswamis, uh, in particular with respect to Rasa theory, uh, but uh, also the whole process of um, of of bhakti bhakti as seva. 
And so we understand in the most basic sense what is our relation to God. It's one of service. God is the supreme uh, master and we are his servants. So that's a relationship uh, which is defined in terms of um, you can say also it's an analogy. Our mm. experience of servants and masters in this world gives us some idea of what it would be to be God's servant, but only only a slight. But the process that's given, the details of the practice, fill out uh, what that would mean in practice. This also necessarily... Uh requires uh, multiplicity of entities, fundamental entities, yes. God yeah. and others. So Yes. Yeah, which, you know, puts us at, um, puts us at loggerheads with the Advaita Vadins. Right. <laughs> um, but again, uh, to see similarities and parallels uh, in the Abrahamic traditions, they to my knowledge, uh, for the most part, also insist on individuality. And again, I was just reading the, in the Islamic theological tradition, they're very strong on this point, although they have this notion that uh, living beings are created at some time, moment in time, all the Abrahamic religions mm -hmm. have that idea. But then, from then on, uh, existing eternally and individually. Yeah. And they put a lot of emphasis on the idea of our responsibility uh, for right action uh, and, yes, right behavior uh, in our relation with God. Uh, a sorry fourth... To, yeah, sorry to... Maybe I can ask uh, one question after you enumerate this five. That would be right yeah, right. just the two. There's two more. Mm -hmm. One is a, a person is free. Now, how you want to take freedom? Well, um, that is understood in different ways, and it's part. It's another debate. Is uh, you know free will versus destiny, mm -hmm. and if God's control is absolute, then where is our freedom? Um, the, the Bhagavad Gita is mm, based on this understanding that we are free because Krishna is giving Arjuna a choice. Mm. He's, he's urging him to fight and he's kind of saying, even if you don't fight, you'll end up fighting <laughs> 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 because it's your nature. But still, he's giving him a choice, uh, implying that we all have a choice. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, we understand our choice is rather narrow. It's kind of um, digital. It's one or zero. It's yes or no. It's yes to Krishna or no to Krishna, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes to Maya. Um, but then again, it's also something more than that because we say yes to Krishna and then how are we saying yes to Krishna? How are we serving Krishna uh, in infinite variety of ways? Okay, freedom and the final one. Uh, this is a kind of technical term. A person is incommunicable. Now that doesn't mean that a person cannot communicate. That's not what it means. Um, what it means is you can't replace one person with another person and say, well, they're both persons, so what's the difference? It means that each one really is unique. Yeah. And you could, you could say irreplaceable, in a sense. Yes. Um, technically, it's explained. This is the characteristic which distinguishes a person from being an instance of a nature, mm -hmm. uh, just being a, a sample of, you know, some particular nature. No, a person is, is more than that, is ir irreplaceable. And I would say also there's um, 
maybe I don't know if this could be a sixth um, attribute, but irreducible. He, living be, uh, sorry, persons are irreducible to something less than being person. Yeah, <laughs> right. So this uh, all uh, kind of uh, parallels with even the very first verse of Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see the tree probably is uh, resonating with Swarat. <laughs> God is somebody who has uh, infinite amount of freedom. And then mm. uh, Avigya Swarat is Avigya, uh, I mean, is aware of everything. <laughs> kind of. Yes. Uh, yes, that is um, um, the idea of omniscience, uh, which mm -hmm. is attributed. Uh, typically to God. There is a, in the philosophy of religion um, in the West, uh, there's uh, a lot of talk about um, what's called perfect person theology um, or perfect, sorry, perfect being theology that uh, there will be certain characteristics, for example, omniscience, um, omnipotence, all goodness, mm -hmm. being eternal, being... They also use the term simplicity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Divine simplicity, uh, something like that. Uh, well, it's the idea that God is, is not composed of parts, mm -hmm. right. which could then be separated. Um, God is transcendent, God is also imminent. All these are part of perfect being theology. Right. So, uh, so that conception uh, is uh, something like God is a, certainly not a monolithic uh, substance, certainly not. <laughs> but still, uh, yeah. how, if God is that kind of stuff, then uh, how does personhood really manifest? Mm. Do you see a contradiction over there? Or... Well, uh, I think that's that's the ongoing discussion. You know, how do you how do you then relate all of this to understand or realize God? Mm -hmm. uh, in the, the in the philosophy of religion, there's a lot of you know sort of um, um, on a level of um, rational propositional. Uh, discourse uh, which is which arguably has its limits mm. um, it's interesting it, it it's kind of brought out in the Bhagavatam uh, the question is raised in the beginning of Canto 10 chapter 87 prayers of the personified mm -hmm. Vedas that how is it possible to with with human language uh, to describe the absolute truth right and the answer that comes after many or in the course of many many prayers um very rich prayers of um, veda stuti is um there's no problem. <laughs> There's no problem for two reasons. One, because God is all powerful and therefore he can, um, he can give language by which we can communicate uh, the nature of God. And furthermore, it's no problem because mm, every Ultimately, every word or all of language is just for that purpose. It's just for glorifying God. And so that's what the uh, personified Vedas are doing in, in those verses. They're, they're answering the question by giving, an, uh, by modeling how to do it. They're modeling how to speak about God. They just go ahead and do it. <laughs> yeah. And then as we read, as we hear those verses, we come to appreciate, oh, well, this is understandable. This is, you know, it can be 
comprehended. Yes. It's comprehensible. Um, but always there's um, always there's a sense of a remainder. Uh, and remainder, you know, in Sanskrit, the word remainder is shesha. Shesha. And so that's taken up in our, um, and this is part of Pancharatra, really, the idea that the Lord expands to become Balaram. Mm -hmm. And Balaram does many different services for the Lord, all kinds of services. Yeah. In fact, that's his whole raison d'etre. He simply wants to serve the Lord. And if all when when all the services are done, um, are are taken care of, uh, in case anything is left over, Shesha, yes, that is taken by Balaram as well. <laughs> uh, so it, we can also kind of derive from that uh, that it's um, in taking shelter of Balaram, we understand how to fully comprehend Krishna because it's mm -hmm. Balaram who is the, um, the Adi Guru. Mm -hmm. I'm just sort of rambling. I'm not sure where I'm going with this. Yeah, maybe. Uh, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, just, I have a couple of questions, if you permit. Uh, can I ask? Uh, sure. So, uh, so in the beginning, we were talking about uh, uh, analytical approaches uh, to decipher this mystery. And then the other one is the uh, basically mystical traditions uh, where people emphasize on experiences of the person, personhood. Mm -hmm. You cited the example of Al Ghazali, if I remember correctly. Yes. So, so, so uh, in the example, just now you quoted the Vedastuti uh, in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is uh, 10th canto, 87th chapter. So uh, the same question is perhaps uh, the, both the approaches perhaps uh, are married together in the sense, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, uh, like uh, the words fall sort of, the analogies fall sort of for describing the absolute truth. And, uh, uh, and the other approach is uh, you experience the Lord uh, directly. So, mm. so as, as you just now mentioned, uh, so as you pursue this, uh, uh, rational approach, analogical approach. Uh, we we words we, we use words to describe uh, supreme Lord. And then at one point, the same words uh, reveal their meaning to us. So kind of uh, both direct experience of the Lord. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. we can cite the verse from the Atak uh, Krishna Namadi Navavit Grahya Sevan Mukhe Sevan Mukhe Hi Jiva Do Svayameva Spuratyada. Yes. So, so the both uh, uh, rational approach and then uh, mystical approach is perhaps uh, glued together in, in this uh, understanding. Is that correct? Uh, yes, we might say like that. Um, because if we just look at our, our, our regular practice, we're doing the Bhagavatam, we understand, is, is our foundation. And the Bhagavatam is... Um, is very much uh, concerned with rational understanding of God. There's so mm -hmm. many um, passages which are of an analytical sort, we may say. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the Bhagavatam is narrative. Mm -hmm. So many, you know, stories, um, not story in the sense of not true, but story in the sense of a narrative. Mm -hmm. And narrative is uh, giving insight which uh, simply straight uh, analysis or uh, propositions don't necessarily give us. So the Bhagavatam is both and, and they're nicely married to, married to each other, you can say. Uh, and then the practice of hearing, reading Bhagavatam is just that, it's a practice. Mm. And it's a practice which um, we understand has a result of purification. Nashta praheshvabhadrishu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavati uttama shalke bhakti bhagavati naishtiki 
um, bhakti becomes naishtiki, mm -hmm. um, becomes fixed as a process, as a result of of this hearing and chanting of of the Bhagavatam. And so Srila Jiva Goswami put the Bhagavatam front and center of our of our tradition, mm -hmm. um, such that indeed the more um, um, propositional side of understanding, the more rational side, and for lack of a better word, the more mystical side, um, <laughs> they really come, they come together uh, so that, so that uh, the, the garden of bhakti uh, it is nicely nourished. Yeah. Yeah, this is interesting. Uh, and the regarding uh, the five, uh, or maybe six, the sixth one you added, uh, characteristics of being a person. So probably may, most of them appear to be circular. <laughs> Say, for example, uh, subjectivity. Yeah. Su subjectivity. Mm. Uh, God being a person should be aware of his own personhood. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of, mm. we are defining personhood and uh, it's becoming a circular attribute that I want to, the person wants to experience his personhood. So, mm. uh, and then, uh, as you said, uh, this uh, the relation, relationship, uh, that is also, yeah, that for us, the Vaishnava understanding, we have conceptions of many, uh, echo, echo, what is that? I'm forgetting uh, the Upanishad words, uh, uh, where we say, uh, out Nityan, of... Nityanam, yeah. Chaitanas Chaitananam. Eko bahunam yo viradati kaman. Is that what you're referring yeah, to? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So there, yeah. uh, at least we save ourselves of being circular, uh, that we have two op two things to have relation. But for monist, uh, I mean, it's a big trouble. It's again becoming circular. <laughs> they have the one person. Uh, but again, in another sense, uh, the... But the God, since it's 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 not a composite thing, uh, he is, is the same stuff. Then it includes his creation also within him. So, I mean, I, I really find it very difficult to reconcile all these ideas. Uh, how do we really logically establish uh, this? Uh, I mean, uh, even in Bhagavatam also, uh, or any other scripture, uh, when somebody wants to establish logically uh, the personality of uh, absolute is that really possible or it's just the or uh, just the play of words uh, we just somewhere around work make some workarounds and <laughs> try to <laughs> <laughs> so. well first of all there are different ways um, when you have a word like person um, it, there there are different ways to approach you know defining personhood or the person um, the, the ways of defining uh, are various and one one way of defining that it's a technical term I don't have it in mind but you just decide this is what I mean by person <laughs> and in one sense that's what we do um, with our understanding of Krishna we we are saying what is a person? Well, let's start with uh, the highest person. And um, okay, then who is that highest person or what would that highest person be like? Well, you can't say like because he's unique. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> then what is he or who is he or how? So then we get the entire descriptions mm -hmm. and the entire Bhagavatam as a whole, we understand is also the person Bhagavad. Right. Wait, how can a book be a person? Uh, <laughs> well, um, let's not make presuppositions about what is a person. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so that opens up to possibility. Uh, in a, uh, the word person, persona, if we take the, the original, the English, which comes from the Greek, and the Greek persona originally meant mask. It was used in the Greek dramas. It was something which was covering over, and so it was a um, 
persona. You took on a certain character. Uh, is that what we mean by person now? Not exactly. Um, books have been written just to trace the history of uh, the meaning of the word person in Western philosophy. Whole books are written on the subject. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, this is interesting. So, uh, so just to uh, nail down the points, uh, so we talked quite a lot about the personhood of uh, the per God being a person or not, and uh, Christianity or say Abrahamic religions. Uh, so they endorse for a personality. So does uh, Islam also endorse personality, or uh, how do you see that? Oh yes, very much. Yes, God is uh, is definitely a person uh, with relation to all individuals and they very much emphasize the individuality of mm -hmm. um of all of all people uh i don't think that extends to animals uh, because mm -hmm. they philosophically to my knowledge they're quite rooted in aristotle mm -hmm. who had this idea that there are um human soul, animal soul, yeah, right. <laughs> vegetable soul, you know. <laughs> yeah, we made the discussion on form and substance, uh, per, rever, I mean, reverse the, his master's, Plato's uh, idea and kind yeah. of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's there also. But no, Islam is very much uh, personalist in that sense. But for them, person, uh, this person who is God, who is God, Allah, is um, so much other uh, than anything mm, that he his he doesn't have a form. It's not that he doesn't have a material form, but he doesn't have a form. It seems, uh, and therefore, more than any of the other Abrahamic traditions, they're extremely. Uh, strong on this point that there should be no representation, no effort to yeah. represent God. And that, of course, has been the cause of uh, so much um, confrontation and conflict, especially in India, uh, where um, the Ved Vedic and post-Vedic traditions are kind of exactly the opposite, mm. that uh, God is, because he's unlimited, uh, it is no problem for him that he also has form, and any forms we see in this world are but reflections of his original form. Um, and can he be represented? Yes, if God directs us how to re represent him, um, we can do so. And we don't have to be confused thinking that God is only present in this form. Mm -hmm. And that's the worry of the um, Abrahamic traditions, that if you represent God, then you will be uh, thinking God is only in this murti and nowhere else. And we don't, uh, the Vaishnavas don't have that problem. Yeah, for uh, Vaishnavas, uh, I mean, for us, the deities uh, are probably, I mean, he, the devote, for the devotees, uh, it's, it's one hundred percent Krishna standing, <laughs> the same transcendental person. So, but uh, for somebody who is not, I mean, into this tradition, for him, really doesn't make a distinction between uh, uh, the statue being a stone and uh, really the personality of Godhead. I mean, the supreme person uh, with all attributes, all perfection. So this poses a little uh, problem. At least intellectual problem that um, I mean, how, how do you, how do you really establish it philosophically? Well, I think that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Actually, <laughs> I've I've um, I've I've written a small book which is going to be coming out soon uh, with the Australian BBT. It's called mm -hmm. Krishna's Wonderful Form: A Guide for the Perplexed. Mm -hmm. It's specifically on this topic. How do we understand uh, 
the deity in the temple. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Maybe we can briefly, maybe a few minutes, if you could kindly. Uh, just, well, in, in the first part of the book, I'm addressing the, um, the basic um, charge uh, of idolatry from mm -hmm. the Jewish tradition. And the way I do this is to go to um, one analysis by Jewish scholars of what is idolatry. And they've identified five, five different sorts of understanding or types of idolatry. Um, and so I go through each one of these in some detail. Um, one of them is representation, the idea that you can represent God by, you know, some physical form. Mm -hmm. um, the, the claim is that you cannot do that. Uh, there's, there's the biblical prohibition against doing that. Um, and so I just say, well, in, in the Vaishnava tradition, it's quite the opposite. It's it's that um, it's very good and healthy and helpful uh, to represent God if one has uh, a proper understanding of, of God um, by which one does not, you know, think that God is only in this form. Mm -hmm. um, and then with that proper understanding, one can engage in service by which sevan muke hi jivado, et cetera, mm -hmm. the senses yeah. become rishikeni rishikesha sevanam bhaktiruchate, the senses become purified. Mm -hmm. So I just um, kind of go one after another in, through these. Um, the first of the principles of idolatry is actually um, most people are not familiar with. It's the notion of betrayal. And this goes back to the earliest Jewish idea that um, that um, Yahweh is, is the God of Israel and um, the Israelis uh, must follow his orders. And if they don't, they're being unfaithful and their unfaithfulness is compared uh, to prostitution, uh, which is, uh, can be punishable by, by death. And so they took it very seriously. Um, but that applies to Jews in Israel, uh, you know, worshiping their Israeli God, who through history they came to see as the universal God. Um, so that doesn't apply very much, but I show how we understand from um, some of Krishna's statements in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. Mm -hmm. He's also, in effect, speaking about loyalty. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, he's keeping things quite open. He says, if you want to worship the demigods, you can do that. And I will give you even the faith that you do that. And you will get the results. And you will get the results quickly. But you should know that those results are actually coming from me. And you should know that you're actually kind of you're actually quite foolish to be worshiping those devatas <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because everything is coming from me. Right. Yeah. So, like that. Also, uh, worship uh, as error. Uh, one of the forms of idolatry is to do the wrong kind of worship. One of the interesting uh, things that came up in the reading I did was that uh, it seems there was a practice amongst uh, the Jewish people to chant names of God. Mm -hmm. um, but then it seems that this became neglected. Mm -hmm. And 
um, and uh, Maimonides, who wrote this book, A Guide for the Perplexed, the original Guide for the Perplexed, in the, what, 12th century? Um, he was concerned that people are going to get even more distracted now if they have some some murti yeah. <laughs> of God. They're just going to get caught up in that uh, mm -hmm. in that worship, and they're going to forget uh, the. I don't think by that time they were chanting, so I don't know what his worry was. But anyway, uh, there was some kind of practice of chanting names of God. Okay. So we would say, well, that's a form of God. Mm -hmm. It's a sound form. Right. Many different kinds of ways that God can appear, and one of them is sound. And we might want to even say, well, uh, you don't like to see a visual form, that's fine. Mm -hmm. No problem. Then just chant the names of God. And... Uh, and the idea that one cannot uh, pronounce the name of God, that's also there in Judaism. But that's a later development. It wasn't there originally. And in the Islamic tradition, they have their 99 names of God. Mm, right. Uh, which are all describing different qualities, mm -hmm. attributes. So, and in the Sufi traditions, I think that they're especially they're chanting names. Mm -hmm. So, Islam, even though uh, it prohibits uh, portrayal of uh, God uh, mm -hmm. in, some, in some pictorial way, but still yeah. uh, they do chant uh, so many names. Uh, I mean, that is itself the form of God. <laughs> so, yes, uh, and and also yeah. the the Quran itself as a as a book, we can say that's the, that's a form of God for yeah. Islam. Right. Um, it's one way it's been explained is that for Islam, the Quran is the equivalent of Jesus in the Christian tradition in yeah. terms of mediation between God and humanity. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we can you know the Vaishnava can say that's fine. You don't want to have a um, a visual form of God, no problem, no problem, no worries, as, <laughs> as the as the Australians say, no worries, mate. Uh, so you can, you know, chant names of God. You can hear the Quran. That's fine. So the um, just to sum up uh, the the Bhagavatam conceptions uh, uh, really embraces. Uh, I mean the. The verse that Vadanti uh, Tattva Vidas Tattum Yad Gyanam Madhyam Brahmeti Paramatmeti Bhagavan Iti Sabjati. Bhagavan Iti So we do have a conception where uh, we accept that God is. If if somebody raises the question, is God uh, not a person? We have an answer. Yes, he is not a person. Probably. <laughs> and then we have uh, Bhagavan is person with all attributes. And then we yeah. have intermediate also, <laughs> Paramatma. Yeah. So kind of, this philosophy is kind of uh, uh, yeah, comprehensive. Yeah. So well, that's that's one understand. That's one way of understanding um, a a, re a religious tradition is always aspiring for comprehensiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is one way of expressing that comprehensiveness is. Um, Brahmeti, Paramatmeti, Bhagavaniti, Shabdiyate. Mm -hmm. Yes, all three. Three in oh, one. Yeah. Nothing, nothing left after that. <laughs> this is an interesting way to reconcile, uh, really. Mm. And uh, then the other part is... Well, uh, yeah. nothing left except for the Shunyavad, Shunyavadi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is... They will say, you know... Actually, there's ultimately there is this shunyata, but that's another subject. But uh, they write volumes and volumes and volumes of books to explain this shunyata. <laughs> How does uh, this uh, Bhagavatam theology uh, can it embrace uh, the sunyavada also in some way? 
I find one very nice way that we embrace it, uh, and that is in the prayer by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Yugaitam nimeshena chakshusha pravishaitam shunyaitam jagat sarvam govinda virahina me. Uh, that in the absence of Govinda, I experience only emptiness. And it's interesting, that's another thing I was just reading, because there have been long debates within Buddhist traditions, what do we mean by shunyata? Mm. Uh, there's been a proposal by some scholars that, well, maybe the best way to get at, get at what we're talking about is to focus on the experience. What What is our experience of shunyata? Mm -hmm. And to that then i would say well we have an experience of shunyata mm -hmm. and this is what it is and this is how it comes about it comes about for uh, one who has such intense devotion for govinda that feeling this absence of govinda one sees everything is empty <laughs> yeah, this is really interesting <laughs> this is wonderful thank you thank you so much for that uh, uh, it's already in our time. It's eight forty-five. Uh, yes. We have some more time uh, if you are available, or a few more minutes. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so maybe uh, we can carry forward the discussion next time. Uh, but uh, for today's uh, completion, uh, so we discussed uh, a lot about uh, the nature of the personhood of God. So uh, regarding the creation of God, uh, I mean, uh, in abstract sense. Uh, as we were discussing in the beginning, the divide between God and his creation or in the similar parallels, uh, maybe mind and uh, body, mind-body dualism. So in that same note. So uh, how, what is the really the existence of uh, the other side? I mean, uh, we at one, at one instance, we are saying that uh, it is part of God, God being uh, creator of everything. I mean, everything is included within absolute truth, then uh, how do you really uh, position the creation or the energy of uh, uh, the expansions of uh, that is emanating from God? I mean, how do you really position? Advaitans uh, kind of uh, radically differ from the Vaishnava conceptions. I don't know what other religions and other traditions, uh, they, how do they pose? Um... I'm, yes, I'm not so knowledgeable myself. I know that in the Greek Orthodox Christian tradition, they speak about God's energies. Um, but whether, how much we can make parallels with our understanding of energies, I'm not sure, because they're very much rooted in the ancient Greek uh, tradition, again, uh, mainly Aristotle. Well, Actually, they may go more to Plato, mm. uh, the Orthodox, than the West. But, mm, of course, in our tradition, um, this is straight Vaishnava Vedanta, uh, the idea of Shakti Parinama Vada, which Srila Jiva Goswami gives us, that uh, the, uh, there is sh Shakti and there's Shakti Man. Uh, there is... Brahman, and there's the energy or energies of Brahman, and they are, um, that's where the specific idea of simultaneous, inconceivable simultaneous oneness and difference comes. Right. Um, inconceivable, but at the same time, kind of not so difficult to understand. In other words, the example of we go to examples. Jiva Goswami says, like the sun and the sunlight. And we look and we see sun and we see the sunlight. And, well, that's not very difficult. You know, we have it every day, the sunlight and the sun. <clears throat> so um, there's an, an, in, an intimate relation between and a kind of inseparability, we say, between the ener energetic and the energy. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and that enables us to say that there is change, there is transformation, mm -hmm. there is so on, because it's it's um, it's kind of against the rules of the game to say that Brahman changes. That's uh, you know you break the rules when you do right. that. So we don't say that. Mm -hmm. We say that the energies of Brahman are ch changed. Right. Shakti parina, Shakti parinama bada. So this That's is my the, understanding. So this example uh, of uh, sunshine, I also find it a little difficult in the sense, uh, I mean, the the stress on the word simultaneous is little, uh, for me, a little problematic. I mean, I'm, I'm not able to follow mm. it properly. So when, when we cite the word simultaneous, uh, I mean, say the example of uh, sun and sunshine, sun mm. is right within my room and it's not within my room. So... <laughs> How do they really fit into my simultaneous existence? Uh, I mean, uh, I, I really find it very difficult. Could you uh, kindly elaborate a bit, uh, if possible? I don't know how to. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> well, in in that analogy, um, the sun is is in your room, but if you close the curtains to your window, then immediately the sun is kept out. Um, in other words. Mm, the source of that light um, because it has been cut off by your curtains uh, prevents mm, the energy, in this case the light, to come through even though the sun uh, even though the sun is so far away it's coming through as long as the window is open uh, mm. and that is the, the non-difference and then we we see the um, dependence of the energy on the energetic as soon as we block the ener the energy. You see what I'm saying? The the sun ray that's coming, as they say, ninety three million miles, mm -hmm. is a constant stream. Right. It's not that it's you know some something that just got sent out and the, and then the sun turns off or something it's a constant stream it's mm -hmm. ongoing right. so in the same way um we are ourselves we are therefore part Prabhupada used that expression part and parcel of god um, we are connected with god uh, all the time Mm -hmm. And therefore, we are alive because we have that connection. I see uh, a hand up, and there yeah, is please. Dr. Varun Shukla, Vanam Alidas. Should we respond? Yeah, yeah please, please. And uh, I also also posted in the chat box. If any of the participants if you have any questions, one two more questions, uh, it's already uh, and uh, it's fifty, but we can still maybe one two questions you can take. Yeah, Banamali, uh, thus, uh, if you want, you can unmute yourself. Hare Krishna, my Dandat Madam. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, there are four Vaishnava Sampradaya. So, uh, from which Sampradaya uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, and Moses came? Ah, <laughs> yeah, the idea of sampradaya, of course, they don't use the expression sampradaya, that's uh, from the um, from the Vedic or post-Vedic tradition, but they do speak uh, very much of, um, of a kind of succession, uh, which, yes, as I understand, comes from, um, from Abraham and uh, then goes through various so many generations, and I believe they speak of Jesus as um, as being a descendant. Um, I, I don't know if that's, I think so, that's used, uh, a descendant of King David, and, and these, there, it's been so long since I've read any of this, but uh, in at least one of the four main gospels, 
in the very beginning, they list so many names uh, to highlight, to make this point that, you know, there is this succession. There is one more question from uh, Charuta Kale. So mm -hmm. he, I don't know, he or she, perhaps she. So uh, he's saying that, how do we explain God's omnipotence and benevolence in the face of uh, sufferings like uh, that is happening in Ukraine currently and all the suffering that, uh, that has already existed in this world? Well, you know, that is the uh, ever... <laughs> Per perennial question, uh, yeah. which is not something I think I can get into this time. Um, yeah, right. The the discussion on um, how I mean you have worded uh, the question in a certain way, and it's 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 a question which has engaged uh, theologians for centuries and more than centuries for millennia. Right. And the effort to answer the question is called theodicy. Theodicy is essentially the effort to explain how a, how a perfect being, um, God, can be existing and what we experience as, um, as, as evil in the world, how all of the, how how these can be reconciled. Um, and it's difficult. It's, it's really difficult. Uh, we do it, but uh, whether anyone has done it really thoroughly, Srila Prabhupada generally uh, uses the analogy of the prison, that we are being punished, we are in a condition um, which is one essentially of punishment, and uh, but it's also of reform. And so if we understand that purpose of the material world uh, as, as reform above all, then uh, we can understand how, how God is allowing uh, so many miseries to take place. Still, it can be difficult, and uh, especially this has been challenging for the Jewish tradition after the what is called the Holocaust, uh, the um, essentially the murder of some six million Jews, mainly in Germany, also here in Poland. Um, you know, what kind of God would allow this to happen? And they've. Again, they've written volumes and volumes and volumes of books trying to answer this question. Yeah, this uh, problem of evil is really <laughs> the foremost argument of even the atheist uh, to say that there is no God. This, mm. this is really, maybe mm. we can, if you permit, next time we can reflect more on these issues. Uh, or maybe yes, okay. Uh, there is just one more question. Uh, Sankar, uh, Sankar da, from Sankar Das. If you like, you can directly unmute yourself or you can type. Hello. Yes, Hare. I want to ask yep. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, please go uh, ahead. I, I want to ask that uh, after studying so many, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, after studying so many uh, religious, uh, currently many forms of religions, what is your experience? Like, are we reaching uh, to a stage where we can understand the God or still we are in the process of understanding it? Because many mm. religions have actually tried to understand it from man their perspective. We mm -hmm. cannot compare every religion to each other, but yes, they are still figuring out about the God. So what mm -hmm. is your remark on this point? Yeah, uh, I think Thank you. It's an interesting question, which I think one could take as an individual or as um, in a collective sense. Uh, are we, are we Correct. the human yes. race? Collective. Yeah. Are we yes. as a human race coming to a better understanding of who is God? Um, one would like to hope so. <laughs> one would like to hope yeah. so. But <laughs> yes. what wonders 
one yeah. sometimes wonders if we are making any progress. Uh, mm. I personally go through different moods. Sometimes I'm feeling more hopeful and sometimes less. But mm -hmm. I'm especially hopeful thinking how, um, how strongly and clearly our own acharyas have presented mm -hmm. um, the bhakti tradition uh, to mm -hmm. identify God as indeed uh, having a name, having a place, having uh, qualities, name, form, qualities, pastimes. Um, for me, mm -hmm. this is our hope that people can really this is this is um, you know so attractive. Krishna is so attractive. Um, yes, that yes, very true. It's very true. It's, it's a mm -hmm. Prabhupada had great. He had great, uh, great faith and hope that the world would take, take up this idea of God and Correct. take it seriously. Correct. So, yeah. Any further questions uh, from the participants or? You can uh, uh, Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for asking this nice question. So uh, I don't think we have uh, more questions for today. Uh, it's already 9 p.m. <laughs> in India. Mm -hmm. uh, it must be yes. 4.30 at your place. Uh, yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Krishna Tumaras, uh, and, uh, for kindly My pleasure. enlightening us in so many varied uh, aspects uh, from your rich experiences that you carry over the many decades. So we hope to hear from you uh, in subsequent uh, days, uh, next week. Of course, yes. next, week, next week, the discussion will be a bit shorter because uh, he has another engagement. Right a little after. shorter, yes. We can wrap it up in uh, one hour. So, Yes, so, what is our topic next week? I, I'm looking. Hermeneutics <laughs> of faith and reason across traditions. Mm -hmm. Or any other thing, uh, if you like to make uh, a natural uh, carry forward from this discussion, you can suggest, or uh, maybe problem we will we can discuss whatever you feel. Yeah, appropriate. we can perhaps we can address this also. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much. Okay. Uh, today we discussed uh, quite a lot about the personhood of God and uh, how different traditions uh, say different things about personhood. We talked about uh, uh, two approaches, uh, if you, if I'm right, uh, the analogical rational approach and then uh, uh, this mystical approach, which is there practically every tradition and our Bhagavatam, which is uh, kind of so wonderful literature that it embraces uh, all kinds of uh, aspects uh, that are explored in different religions. It embraces rational and also mystical tradition. So it's such a, such a wonderful text. And um, uh, Krishna Yatra Maharaj is, uh, I would say, living exam, I mean, living Bhagavat because he's uh, exemplifying through his uh, practices uh, the message that is there in Bhagavatam. So we are so delighted and so honored that he kindly agreed uh, to be with us and enlighten us. So we are so thankful to you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. Thank you and all the best to all of our participants. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.